So if it turns out that God is real, I want you to think about what's the one question that you would ask. I mean, think about it. Like, what is it that you want to know? And the reason we worded it that way is because not all of you believe that God exists. It's, it's true. Some of you are visiting with friends and you're here. Thank you for joining us. Some of you are watching online. You found, you found us on TV and you're like, I don't really know what this is all about. Some of you have been attending for a long time and you're still skeptical or unsure. But if it turns out that God is real, and, and I believe that he is, what question would you ask? And when I think about it, I'm guessing one of the questions we all kind of want to know the answer to, whether we have the courage to ask it or not, is how am I doing? Are, are we doing it right? Am I on track? Am I doing enough? And so if you're wondering that, I actually believe Jesus answers that question. Are we doing it right? How do we know we're on the right track? But my guess is that his answer is not what most of us would expect. In fact, I believe that if Jesus were to answer that question, are we on the right track or what is it that is required of me? it may require you to lose your religion. And so I wanna welcome you to Cedar Creek, whatever campus you are at. Those of you watching online, on TV, if you're one of the men at TOCI, if you're one of the individuals who came back after Easter, thank you for being here. In fact, I love to ask those of you physically here to put your hands together to welcome our online TV <laughs> men audience just to say hello. If you have grown up in church, if you have walked away from the church, if you're not sure why you're in church today, if you feel burned out, bored by, burned it, burdened by the church, I'm so glad you are here this weekend. Uh, my goal over the next few weeks is to convince you to lose your religion and to replace it with a life-giving relationship with Jesus. And you may not understand what all of that means. That's okay. We're going to talk about it. Um, the inspiration for this series really started a, a couple of months ago when I ran into a guy who used to attend Cedar Creek pretty regularly and stopped. And I hadn't seen him in about 15 years. And recently we got reconnected. And uh, as we've been hanging out over the past couple of months, um, I said, why did you stop attending? And he said, well, uh, I, it kind of became like a box that I checked. And I, I don't know that I really had a, an experience or connection with God. And I was confused. Like, how could that be? Like we talk about having a relationship with God all the time here. Like, like I, I, I feel like sometimes we make it obvious and then I realize, man, I wonder how many people like him are sitting out there unsure of what it means to personally connect with, with God. And then I, I, a couple months ago, I saw this series at a church that I follow in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, LCBC. Um, a friend of mine's the lead pastor there. And as I was watching the series called Losing My Religion, I fell in love with the framework and I thought, man, I think this could really be helpful here. So I reached out to Jason, uh, the lead pastor there. Jason, if you're watching, thank you so much. He gave us permission to you. Oh, sure, give him a hand clap. You know Jason. So uh, we're gonna be using some of their framework and I really believe this has the potential to be a faith defining moment for many of you. For those of you who've been in church your whole life, for those of you that are new and just getting, or maybe just getting back, if you feel like you've been burned by the church, burned out by being in church, confused by the church, my invitation to you starting this weekend is let's lose our religion together, okay? And so to get started, this is gonna be a bit of a pivot. I have a question for you, a random question. Uh, do we have any Chuck E. Cheese fans here? Any Chuck E. Cheese fans? Oh yeah, a few hands, confident. I see some kids. You adults aren't brave enough to put your hand in the air. Because I mean, you know, Chuck E. Cheese is for kids, right? It's a pizza place where, you know, and as a kid, I love Chuck E. Cheese. I can still remember the first time I got to experience Chuck E. Cheese way back in the 1900s when I was raised in Columbus, Ohio. I got good grades and uh, I remember the pizza a bit. I remember the lights, the games, it was amazing. I loved the, well, I loved most of the experience. You know what I didn't like, what I don't really like about Chuck E. Cheese is those life-size animatronics, okay? You know, up on the stage that just out of nowhere start singing. If you've never been to Chuck E. Cheese, you don't know what you've saved yourself from. But when I went, this is kind of what it looked like. You'd be in the middle of your dinner, and these animals would start looking at you and talking. You know, it's like, what the, what? Is, they don't even blink the same way. You know, it's creepy. Eventually, they did upgrade the animatronics. 
You can decide if this is actually an upgrade. I'm not really sure, but uh, there's something about this that just isn't right. It doesn't sit right with me, okay? You with me? I'd love to be in that creative meeting, okay? I, whenever that happened, when they sat down, what? Keep your eyes here, people, okay? I know you're tempted. I know you're tempted. I'd love to be in that creative meeting where it's like, I know what we should do. The kids are going to love it. We should make our mascot a rat that sings. And they're like, I love it. I love it. And they start singing songs that we know. And as a kid, you're like, oh, I know that song. And you're tempted to look. And then they make eye contact with you with those eyes that are like, I'm watching you. I'm always watching you. It's like they're saying, I'll see you in your dreams tonight. You know, it's like so weird. Even if you're not the praying type, you'll pray. You'll be like, God, please save me from them. Oh, man, the scariest part of these uh, animatronics is that do doll eye effect. I think one of them got Katy Perry at the Super Bowl a couple years ago. She had a little <laughs> trouble getting through the performance. These animatronics are so creepy that it inspired a game that's come out recently called Five Nights at Freddy's. If you haven't heard of this game, it it's became a movie, but it's like these animatronics sneak around in the dark every night trying to fill up their internal emptiness with a body. To, uh, have I taken this too far? Okay, I probably have. I'm, I probably have. Sorry. You know. So when I was a kid, I loved Chuck E. Cheese. Let's go back there, right? Uh, and you didn't go to Chuck E. Cheese for the animatronics. You didn't go there for the pizza. You know that's trash. <laughs> you didn't even go there really for the birthday party. You, I went there for the games, right? It was like a dream. Unlimited screen time with Rampage and Street Fighter and Space Invaders. And then, and then I realized the games, those special games like Ski Ball and Whack-A-Mole and the Coin Pusher, the, those, once you discover those, it's game on because those were the tool to get you what you really wanted. It's the tickets. I know they don't have them anymore. They... <laughs> Kids these days are getting robbed of their experience, you know, back in the good old days with Space Jam and, you know, riding your bike without a helmet and tickets at Chuck E. Cheese. Okay, those were the good old days. So I remember after realizing the ticket machine, how many quarters or tokens I had wasted on just video games. Because when you hit that ski ball 10,000 and you see the machine like, and you're like, oh, oh, I, I see. There's, I mean, there's nothing like walking around Chuck E. Cheese with like a fistful of tickets that are like dragging on the ground. You know, some cute girl sees you, you're like, hey, you see something you like? <laughs> Thought so. You know, it's like, you worked hard for those tickets, man. It's amazing. And then at the end of your time together, you know where you ended up as a kid. You ended up at that counter with the cornucopia of things that you might be able to take home. This is a parent's worst nightmare now that I have kids. I know the truth about this. But when I was a kid, I'd let my eyes feast on the opportunity. You see the remote control car. You had the stuffed animal that was the size of you. You had the giant slinky. What do you do with that? You know, it's like, it doesn't even work, right? You have the mega water gun. And there, you see, you see 100,000 tickets next to it. And you're like, I'm pretty sure I'm close to that here. You know, you give them your tickets. They come back. They're like, it's 300 tickets. And you're like, are you sure? Did you learn how to count? Because my estimate. And then, you know, they're like, no, sir, it's 300. And they're like, what would you like? And you realize the only thing you're going home with is a rainbow eraser, a visor with the rat on it, and a Tootsie Roll. It's like, <laughs> it's like all of that for not, you know, it's like, you got to be kidding me. So let's just imagine for a second with all of this uh, you know, Chuck E. Cheese nostalgia, let's just imagine we're feeling, we're feeling it. We want to go back and see if we got our skee ball skills and see if things have changed. And so we go and we get tickets or uh, you know, we get tickets on a card if you need the card. You know, and you go to the counter and it's the same dumb junk that you were offered when you were a kid. And so it's like, you know what? I think I can use this for something better than that. And so on my way home, I go by Brondi's Ford, and they got one of those new Broncos parked out front, you know, the Raptor edition. Come on, somebody, you know that's sharp, right? And I'm, I'm like, I, I, I walk in, I'm like, hey, um, I, want, I want the Bronco, the Notre Dame green Bronco out in front. I want that. And they're like, do you need financing? And you're like, nope, I don't need financing. I'm going to pay with these. <laughs> Feast your eyes, right? They'd be like, you got to be joking. Like, <laughs> are you crazy? I'm like, look at, look at these tickets. <laughs> There's a lot of them here. And they're like, no, sir, you can find your way out or we'll help you get out, right? So I'm feeling a little defeated at this point. I want to drown my sorrows in a Mr. Freeze, what I call a small lie. You know what a small lie is. You order a small, but they give you an extra large. So 
I'm like, I'll take a small Oreo, hot fudge, whatever. They're like, $8.50, and I'm putting these on the counter, and they're like, what are you doing with that? I'm like, I'm paying for the ice cream. They're like, no, you can't. They're like, are you crazy? Now, I know this is a bit ridiculous, but here's the point. How tragic would it be to spend so much time and energy earning tickets only to discover it was all a waste of time because you can't pay with tickets? This might be the easiest way that I know how to talk about religion. Religion is when we focus on what we must do in order to earn tickets for God. Religion is this idea that what God wants most, what God expects from you and me, is to go through life doing a bunch of things, earning a bunch of tickets that we'll cash in someday with him in hopes of earning his approval. And so we think about what does it mean to earn tickets? Well, it typically means doing more good things and doing less bad things. And if we do more good than less bad, then maybe I can walk up to God at the ticket counter in the sky someday and say, hey, I'm in need. I need your approval. I want your forgiveness. I want your favor. I don't want you to be disappointed in me. And so what do we do? Well, some of you went to church today, so thank you for being here. You know, that's a few tickets. And uh, with the number of baptisms that we had, it's not my fault, but service is going to go long today. That's probably double the amount of tickets, you know? It's like, okay. Some of you are thinking about Dollar Club. I'll give it a Dollar Club and a little bit more, you know? It's like, okay, there's a few tickets, right? And you know what? Maybe you gave your wife some flowers this week. That's a ticket. uh, Let's, okay, maybe that's a few more, okay? Because, you know, some of you guys may need to give flowers to your wife this week. It's like, I'm doing all right, you know? This week, I'm doing pretty good. You know what? In fact, I read my Bible this week. That's worth a couple of tickets. I... Some of you read Leviticus. That's a lot of tickets, you know. It's like, if you make it through Leviticus, God is impressed with that. Some, you know, some of you are like, you know what, I stopped swearing, so that's worth a couple tickets, you know. It's like, okay. So, because, uh, you know, I don't want gosh to send me to heck, so there we go. Some of you started praying, it's worth a few tickets. Some of you started praying out loud, you know, that's like scary. You don't want to pray out loud, but you did, and so there we go. You know, it's like, okay, so... Some of you have grown up with this idea, this picture of God. That that, that's, th- this, is, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what God wants. Or, or somewhere along the way, you've picked this up. There's this internal mechanism that's like, ah, oh, God is a giant ticket taker in the sky, and our job is to earn enough tickets to get his approval, to get into heaven. And so that's how you live. And the pro- there's so many problems with this. We're going to actually be talking about the problem of religion over the next few weeks. But one of the main problems is if you play this game, if this is how you think God operates, it raises so many questions that you don't have answers to. Questions like how many tickets are needed? Like when you get to the pearly gates, how many do you need to get in? Nobody really knows. I mean, why? Well, uh, I, I, think, I think I'm a good person. Religion always makes us a little anxious because you never really know if you've done enough. And so it, it carries with us this anxious paranoia. It's burdensome. You're always working for it. You're never sure of it. Why? Because you're wondering, well, how do I earn tickets to begin with? Like, what box do I need to check? What standard do I need to live up to? Is there a standard? And you know what most people do to answer this question? They just compare. They compare their life with the lives of people around them. I mean, we all kind of do that to kind of gauge how many tickets do we have. So we're kind of looking, how many tickets do they have? I got a little bit more than them. They got a little bit more than me. I mean, let's be honest, this doesn't help either. Why? Because you do. You look at some people or you categorize a group of people and you're like, well, at least I'm not those people. I got way more tickets than them. And so you start to feel good for a minute. And then you run into a group of other people and you're like, well, shoot. I'm not as nice, as kind, as generous, as good, you know, whatever. It's like, Mother Teresa, am I ever going to measure up to Mother Teresa? It's like, so where do I stand? I don't really know. So you know what some people do then? They just set their own standard. It's like, well, you do you. You do what feels right. God's probably okay with you. And the problem with that is I don't live up to my own standard. Like I set goals and, and I have standards that I want to be in terms of husband and father and, and with my own life. And And I come more short than I do living up to those things in my life. As I was getting ready for this, I I was reminded of the story of John Stott. He's a Christian author who, for most of his life, did not believe in God. He was an atheist. He would tell people, I don't believe in God. But what started his spiritual journey was when he started to pay attention to the gap 
between his own standards and the reality that he could live up to. I mean, he's known for saying that he observed that he was so high idealed and so weak willed that he couldn't live up to his own ideals. I mean, isn't that true for so many of us? It's like, if not, you probably haven't lived long enough or you're not being honest enough about that gap. And so, so like, how do we earn tickets? Like, we can't even keep up with our own standards. You know what some people do? They look at the 10 commandments. And as you're gonna see, Jesus said, that isn't even enough. And so we're left wondering, how do we even earn tickets? And then there's the question of, can, can we lose tickets? I mean, can you lose tickets for like yelling at your wife or your, your spouse or, or your kids? I know it's hard to get ready and come to church on the weekend, right? And so we're just trying to get out the door. It happens in my house too, but do you lose tickets for that? Do you lose tickets for the words that you say, the things that you spend money on or things that you don't use with your money? Do, do you lose tickets for that show that you've been watching or the thing that you've been clicking on or the things that you've been fantasizing about or for lying about where you were or what happened? This is why the religious game is exhausting because you never really know. I mean, this is why some of you walked away because you got burned by someone. You got burned by someone holding a fistful of tickets who looked at you and let you know in no uncertain terms that you don't have enough. You're wrong, you're unwelcome, you're not qualified. Or, or maybe you walked away because you just got burned out playing the game, checking the box, always living in fear, feeling the pressure. Like, I don't need that in my life. And so you just walked away. Or maybe you just got bored. It felt like a waste, you were going through the motions. There's no sense of a connection with God at all. I mean, some of you might be there right now wherever you're at in that space, man, if that's you, I'm glad that you're here because I have some good news. I have good news for all of us. This is not what God intended for our lives. He has something actually so, so much more. You can actually begin to find freedom from this, from this religious mindset. There is a richer, more life-giving way to live with God, but not all of you are gonna want it. I mean that, not, not everyone will want the life that Jesus offers. I mean, what you see when you read about the life of Jesus is that it was the religious people in Jesus' day that were the most challenged by what Jesus invited everyone to experience. I mean, you see it early on in Jesus' ministry. Luke, somebody who wrote down some of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life recorded that later, as Jesus was leaving the town, the town of Capernaum, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. And so Levi got up, left everything and followed him. And to you and me, if you don't know the story, it seems simple enough. Jesus showed up and invited someone from the IRS to follow him. And I'm thinking, man, more people in the IRS could use a little Jesus in their life. It'd be good, right? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, there we go. Somebody's got a big tax bill over here. I'm just kidding. I actually don't know. <laughs> And so to the first century audience, though, this isn't just like the IRS. This is scandalous. Like this is stomach churning. The best way for me to illustrate this is I want you to think of someone that you look at and you go, man, they're a liar. They're a cheater. I can't trust anything that they say. Like they're a menace to society in your mind. I want you to get that person in your mind. Perhaps it's a politician for you. Maybe it's an ex, you know, somebody you used to be in relationship with. Maybe it's a coworker that just... It's like, oh my goodness, it could, it could be an in-law. If they're next to you, don't elbow them, okay? But you know, get that person in your mind that just makes your stomach turn. And imagine I invited them out on the stage to help me finish this message. Like, come on out here. And they come out and they're gonna talk to you. What, what would your emotions be? You'd, be? you'd be uncomfortable. Like, I would get emails from you. You know, <laughs> people would leave the church. They'd be like, I, I cannot believe you said that, you know, let them talk. This is what Jesus is doing when he's saying, follow me and be my disciple. I mean, this is what it felt like. Tax collectors were the worst. The Old Testament law said that they were excluded from church service, from worship. And so Levi, also known as Matthew, he has no tickets to offer. He's got nothing. And one day, Jesus shows up to where he takes money from people and basically says, I think you have what it takes to be my disciple, to do what I do. 
And so Levi leaves it all behind. I mean, imagine how this fell for Levi. He was probably shocked. He was pumped. In fact, he was so pumped, he threw a party. Later, Levi held a banquet, not just a hangout, a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with him. I mean, Jesus or Levi sent out a text message, invited, not really, but yes, invited all of his friends over, his tax collector buddies. He invited the different Gentiles that he knew, the Romans and people of all sorts of different walks of life over to his house and they're celebrating, they're putting Jesus in the center of the room and he's gonna be like, you're not gonna believe what happened. I mean, to put this in perspective, this was like an OSU fan walking into the Michigan locker room right before the game to give him a pep talk. It's like weird, right? It's like a nun showing up in a nightclub to have a good time. You know, it's like, imagine being one of Jesus' disciples, following him into this room. I mean, it would have been all sorts of awkward. Like, what are we doing here? Like, are we even, what is going on? I mean, for the Jesus' disciples, they're a little uncomfortable. Why? Well, because the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Religious people have a tendency to complain a lot. I don't know why it is, but it's, it's almost like, it, it seems like that sometimes the hyper-religious Christians are addicted to outrage. They're always losing their minds over what's happening. Oh my goodness, look at those people. And I think it's interesting, in this one moment, you, you couldn't get two more opposite extremes. You have Pharisees, the religious people, and they have truckloads of tickets. They're swimming in them. They know the Bible. They go to church multiple times a week. They faithfully follow what the Bible says. They believe in it. They do it all. Watching Jesus eat with people who have no religious activity in their life people who aren't even worthy of going to church or not worthy of worship. And so the religious leaders, they're confused. They're uncomfortable. Like, why is Jesus doing this? Why is he endorsing? He, like, he's basically endorsing everything that they believe, like, everything that they're doing. Like, question is, what side of the story would you be on? Do you know one of the ways to tell if there's some religious tendencies inside of you? is to pay attention to how you react to people who are in rough shape, who live differently than you, who don't have as many tickets as you do, or who don't struggle with, who struggle with things that you don't actually struggle with. And you sit there and you look at their life, what's your initial reaction? Because the religious people tend to react to them or see them as scum. It's like, oh. Well, unless they clean up their life. See, that may be an indicator that you're caught up in the religious game. That you're, you're playing the same game that the Pharisees and teachers of religious law did. And so you're confused and complaining when Jesus shows up in a way that just doesn't make sense to the ticket earning that you've done. And what you notice about Jesus starting here and through most of his life is that he doesn't seem bothered. The son of God isn't like, oh my goodness, look at these tax collectors. Can you believe it? In fact, what you read about Jesus' life, you begin to see a pattern. And the pattern is this. The most outrageous sinners receive Jesus' most compassionate welcome. The people who were most unlike him liked him, and he actually liked them back. And that's really good news for someone like me. It's really good news for us that the most outrageous sinners receive Jesus' most compassionate welcome. If you feel like an outrageous sinner today, this is how Jesus responds to you. But the most religious people tend to receive Jesus' strongest rebuke. It's always the hardest working, ticket earning, rule keeping, Bible following ticket earners that seem to receive Jesus' strongest words. I mean, Jesus does that here. He answers the religious leaders, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do, and I've come, I am here to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners and need a change of direction. That's what repent means. They need to repent. They need a new way to live. 
And so Jesus talks about two groups of people. There are healthy people who've, who've earned some tickets and they think, well, I'm fine. I mean, God probably should be a little impressed. I mean, when you compare me with those people, I'm doing pretty good. It's like, those are healthy people that don't really need God. And then you have the sick and they haven't earned a ticket. In fact, they never will earn tickets. They, they fully understand that they are in need. And Jesus is like, those are the people that I can work with. See, religious people believe that God is attracted to those who have their life together, to those who have their family together, their marriage together, to healthy people who do it right, to people who have more tickets. And what Jesus is illustrating in front of this crowd of people, this mixed crowd of people, is that what moves the heart of God and what, get Jesus, what gets Jesus' attention are people who realize their need. Let me put it this way. There are two conditions. Jesus looks for those who know that they are sick because there are some who are sick but believe that they're not. They think they're fine. And so which category are you in? Like Jesus says, I came for this group and religious people don't really think they have that big of a problem. Or they're working so hard to show God and everybody else that they got their stuff together because of all the things that they do. And what's interesting is this is not a behavior problem. This is not a try harder problem. What Jesus is talking about, this sickness is a heart problem. This is why Jesus taught about the heart over and over and over again. And the fundamental problem with religion is religion can change your behavior, but religion cannot change your heart. That's right. Rules, laws, religion, they can't change people's hearts. It can't change our society, our community, our country. But religious people are convinced if we could just get people to follow the rules, it'll change us. It doesn't. Your heart and my heart does what it wants to do. It does. That's why when you try to cut out sugar or you try to stop scrolling or you're trying to stop whatever it is, there's a little inner voice that says, you could have one more Oreo, Ben. You walk some steps today, buddy. You can do it. There's this, your heart is always tempting you to drift from God's standard, from our own. And Jesus knows <clears throat> excuse me, if we're going to experience the life that God wants, it only happens when your heart changes. I mean, Jesus keeps pushing on this issue. He keeps encouraging people to think about the heart. Why? Because Jesus knows you can do all the right things. You can say all the right things and you can still have a sick heart. And so when he would teach, he would teach in ways that would reveal the heart. He would help people see their inner world. His goal was to help everyone see how in need of a doctor they really are. And so this is why reading some of Jesus' teachings are confusing. On the one hand, you're like, I love what Jesus says. That's awesome. And then he takes it a couple steps further and you're like, oh, they don't quite know what to do with that. I mean, that's what, in essence, the Sermon on the Mount does to anybody who reads it. I mean, for example... In the Sermon on the Mount, he's standing in front of thousands of Jewish people, right? Israelites and some Gentiles. And he says, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. This is one of the Ten Commandments. And so Jesus is like, hey, you remember the Ten Commandments, right? Don't commit murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. And all the ticket earners are like, oh, yeah, I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> I'm doing good. More tickets. And then Jesus would continue. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. It's like, wait, what? Like angry? Like on my way here, a guy got in my way. and I, Like me? But what about... Jesus went on to say, you've heard it said, that, you know, no adultery. Don't commit adultery. And the ticket earners would be like, well, good, no infidelity here, just me and my ride or die. I waited until marriage. Woohoo! And then he says, but I say to you, anyone who looks at someone with lust in their heart has already committed adultery. And people are like, uh oh. You see, time and time again, Jesus would try to push this point home. 
He didn't come to just change our behavior. He came to change our hearts. He wants our hearts to encounter him. I mean, Jesus gave a warning. He said, I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And on the surface, it sounds like what Jesus is saying is, get your life together. Come on, do more. Like, get your stuff together. Let's, let's go. But essentially, what Jesus is warning is if you want to play the ticket earner game, play it. But you better be perfect. I mean, if this is a standard that you want to be held to, go for it. Which means you either try and you go for it and you dedicate your life to all of this religious good behavior and activity or you realize that it's impossible. You're like, I can't. Jesus is like, you're right. You can't. That's why he said it. See, see the sick... Those who are in need of a doctor are at the point of desperation where they're like, I could never live up to that. This is why the sinners without tickets who came to Jesus were honored. And those holding up their tickets as they came to Jesus were scolded. Sinners came humbly, honestly, acknowledging that they could never live up to that standard. And the only way that they could experience God is through grace. The bottom line is grace is the antidote to religion. It's the cure for the sickness of religion and the sickness of our heart. Grace, when we encounter God's grace, he begins to change our heart. And that's what walks us into freedom. For those of you that have been burdened by the church, burned out, bored. For those of you that feel like you've made a mess of your life. For those of you that feel like you have no tickets. And for those of you feeling like you're swimming in them. Because what is grace? Grace is when you are given what you did not earn, what you cannot earn. It is a gift. It's what Jesus followers early on built their life upon. And I can't think of a clearer way to describe God's grace than Ephesians 2, written by one of the first century pastors named Paul. He says that God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the tickets that we've earned, for the good things that we've done so that none of us can boast about it. Salvation, God's grace, is not a ticket-earning expedition. It's not a reward. Following Jesus is not about you and what you and I do. It's about Him. And so this verse is a great verse to commit to memory to commit it to knowing it in your heart. I mean, this may be the simplest way to articulate what Jesus came to offer and accomplish for us. It's the clearest delineation between religion and having a relationship with God. God's salvation is not a reward earned by good people. No, it is a gift given to forgiven people. And so we don't bring our doing to God. We don't bring the things that we've been working on to him in our relationship. We bring our need. And that's what the religious people just couldn't understand. They they couldn't get it. They don't understand. Yeah, but look at all of this. God doesn't give us what we've earned. It wouldn't be worth much anyway. He gives us what we need. See, Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. He didn't come to show us which religion is right. He came to end religion and replace it with his grace and a relationship with him. And how do we experience his grace? Well, Paul says, God saved you by his grace when you believed, when you trusted, when you stood on, when you lived from God's grace in your life. When you realize that it is a gift from God, how do you activate a gift? How do you experience that in your life? You receive it. You don't go to work before somebody shows up with birthday gifts. No, you receive it. You open it. You make it your own. You say, thank you. You you make it a part of your life. And when you begin to recognize that you don't deserve, you can't earn God's grace, that's when you start to get it. And God becomes 
way more personal. And I know some of you, you're like, but Ben, how do I know what God wants from me then? Like, what is it that matters most to him? We're going to talk about that next week. But this week, the question that I want you to think about today is what standard are you going to use to determine where you stand with God? What standard are you going to use to evaluate your life? You basically have two options. You can look at your own effort, the tickets and the good works that you've worked on, and you can hold them up and be like, hey God, look at what I've done for you. Trying to get more tickets, or you can stand on his grace. So what are you going to put your hope in? What truth are you going to live from? What game are you going to play? Because if it's in your effort, if you want to keep doing things for God, you can do that. God's not going to stop you. Just, just know that the clock is ticking. And there will come a day when you will feel burned out, burdened by, bored by the game. Your high ideals will get hijacked by your weak will. And you'll find yourself wondering why you feel so distant from God. It's not going to be because of him. It's going to be because you tried to be your own savior. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you can't think of a time when you've surrendered your life to him. Well, today, God invites you to experience his grace, to bring to him your need, to acknowledge that you have a broken, sick heart. And when we do, what we experience is his forgiveness, his new life. When we move from earning tickets to receiving his grace, you know what you'll discover? That all of the things that we do for God is a response to what he's given us, to what he's done for us. And so we forgive people not to get more tickets, but because we've been forgiven by the God of the universe. So if he forgave me, I can forgive you. When we're compassionate with people around us, it's not because we need to be a nicer person, a good person, no. It's because God was compassionate with us. When we're generous and we give, we're not giving to you know, get more from God or to earn his blessing in our life and his approval. No, we're giving because he was so generous. He gave his one and only son. You can have it all, God. When we're gracious and patient with others, especially those who are not like us, it's not to be a nice person. It's not because God told you to be nice to people. It's because we remember how patient and how gracious God was with us, even in our lowest moments. That's the life of freedom. That's what changes the why behind the what we do. And I want you to experience that. That's our hope. That's where personal relationship with him begins. And we have a song that we've sung on and off over the last year or so. It's called Make Room. And the prayer is I wanna make room for you. Like I need you in my life. And there's one segment of the song that it's just powerful for me. It's inviting God to shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. And his way is grace, love, freedom. So we're gonna invite you to sing that when our band uh, plays it for you in just a minute. And my request is that you would make this your prayer that you would lay down all the tickets that you've been holding on to, or that you would stop letting your lack of tickets be a barrier in your mind and instead bring your need to him. Ask him for his grace. And if you can't think of a moment in your life where you've placed your faith in Christ and received his forgiveness, where you, maybe you're hearing about how to have a relationship